I'm happy to introduce formally uh, Franz von Lehrer to you. He is the 2022-23 Corcoran Visiting Chair in Christian Jewish Relations at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. And when he's not here, he is Professor of History and Director of the Medieval Studies Program at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he teaches in medieval and world history and courses in interfaith engagement. His research interests include medieval Europe, medieval biblical exegesis, and Jewish-Christian relations, especially with a focus on medieval Christian Hebraism. Dr. von Lehre studied at the University of Groningen in his native Netherlands, where he received virtually all of his graduate degrees, I believe, including his doctorate. Yes, <laughs> it just kept going. Um, his publications uh, are wide, uh, but in particular, we would highlight Life at St. Victor from 2021, an introduction to the medieval Bible in 2014, interpretation of scripture, and interpretation of scripture, a practice and a theory book. And he's at work on a book on uh, Christian Hebraism, and he's also editing a critical edition of Andrew of St. Victor's commentary on Isaiah, is it? Uh, out. Out. It's a translation he's working on. He has many irons in the fire. So uh, please welcome him to, uh, as he offers his keynote address, Hebra Hebraios et Eudaios, A Thousand Years of Christian Ambivalence in Two Words. Thank you, Franz. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, Incidentally, two of the publications you mentioned uh, are together with Franklin uh, Harkins, who is uh, uh, sitting over there. Um, it's really an honor uh, to be here, and uh, an, an honor and a, and a pleasure to um, be here as Corcoran Chair, and to organize this conference, which is gives me the opportunity to just invite old friends and people whose scholarship you admire and just say, hey, do you want to come and talk at my conference? And they say, yes, and it's exciting. Um, so uh, thank you all for, for being here. I will uh, try to resist the uh, temptation to, to incorporate everything that I have learned in the past hour and a half into my talk right now. But it is a work in progress, um, and uh, I'm, I'm still working on um, on trying to formulate what I, what I want to say here. Um, Hebraeus Judeus, a thousand years of Christian ambivalence in just two words. I'll start with a poem. The people of the Hebrews with palms before thee went, our praise and love and anthems before thee we present. Thus goes the well-known Christian hymn, All Glory, Laud and Honor, sung in Christian churches on Palm Sunday celebrating the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem before his passion and death. The hymn is John M. Neal's poetic rendering of a poem written by Theodolf of Orléans, a Spanish bishop and courtier at the court of Louis the Pious in 820. Uh, Theodolf today is mainly known for his role in composing the iconoclastic Libri Carolini and for his correction of Jerome's Bible translation, which he did by comparing it with the original Hebrew. So the first words of this hymn, uh, of my quote, people of the Hebrews, sound oddly 19th century. Um, actually, Ben, who is sitting right there, reminded me that when today you talk about Hebrews, uh, you're mainly talking about either nursing homes or life insurance. Um, so what was that? It's, it's, yeah, 19th century. However, they did not flow out of the creative mind of the translator. They can be actually found in Theodolf's 9th century Latin text. So the Latin version of this poem goes, and that's on your handout, Pleps Hebraia tibi cum palmis obvia venit, cum precevoto imnis ad sumus ecce tibi. So why did Theodolf choose the word Hebrai to describe these people who in the New Testament are more neutrally called the crowd? It's very likely that the crowd in Jerusalem greeting this charismatic rabbi Jesus 
would have been predominantly Jewish. So why did Theodulf not use the more common word for Jews, Judai? Apart from the fact of that you need certain syllables to make Latin meter, but that's, I think Theodulf could have solved that if he wanted that. Um, Theodulf does use the word Judai in one of his other poems, a didactic poem on the exegetical meaning of the uses of times and seasons in the biblical text. Um, and times and seasons also meaning the hot season and the cold season. Um, so he says there, Frigura sunt hiemis, judei incredula corda, plebis quae fidei, nuda calor in erant. Cold are the unbelieving hearts of the winter of the Jewish people, which on the inside were denuded of the warmth of faith. So here he is using the word Judaeus. The most obvious explanation for the different word choices would seem that here the word Jew, Judaeus, is associated with unbelief, while earlier the word Hebrew seems to designate those Jews who implicitly acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. But it's not that quite that simple, because Theodulf also uses the, the term Hebrew to refer to practicing Jews. The Hebrews in Theodulf's poem were not the only Hebrews that he encountered. As abbot of Misi, Theodulf oversaw the production of a number of Bibles based on Jerome's translation from the Hebrew. In his establishment of the text of these Bibles, Theodulf took care to compare, and if necessary to correct, Jerome's translation against the Hebrew original. Theodulf probably didn't know Hebrew, but he knew someone who did. We know this from one Theodulf Bible that survives at least partially, uh, the Bible de Saint-Germain. The text contains many marginal editions, which reference the Hebrew text underlying Jerome's translation. Avram Saltman has convincingly identified the author of the Scolia as the early 9th century author of a commentary on Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, later known as Pseudo-Jerome. We know this author only as the anonymous Hebrew, as he is called by another 9th century biblical commentator, Rabanus Morris, who used his work extensively, and he referred to the author as a certain Hebrew of modern times, learned in the knowledge of the law. Carolingian authors commonly referred to practicing Jews as Judei, um, especially in polemical literature, so the religious identity of this Hebraeus has been the subject of some scholarly debate. Um, Johannes Heil will actually have a whole paper on this subject tomorrow. But I'm convinced by uh, Johannes Heil's uh, argument that he was, this Hebraeus was in fact Jewish. And it seems evident that when Carolingian exegetical sources cite other Hebrei, as they often do, they intend to say that these are Jewish rather than Christian sources. So how did medieval Christians use the words Hebraeus and Judeus? And what, if anything, can the distinctions tell us about Christian attitudes towards Jews and Judaism in this period? It's kind of the, the mirror of the question that Robbie answered I think it's the first time that I, a paper of mine is actually, was actually quoted before I even uh, 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 read it. So both words, Judeus and, uh, and Hebraeus, trace their origin to the Hebrew Bible. The most common word for the Jewish people in the Hebrew Bible is, of course, Israel. But this term was usually avoided by medieval Christians for contemporary Jews possibly because they considered the church, the true Israel. In the Hebrew Bible, Abraham is called the Hebrew in Genesis, ha-ivri. And we also find the word uh, Hebrew in Exodus, where it signifies the people of Israel as they are dwelling in Egypt. Now, scholars are still divided on whether the word is an ethnonym or not. It has been pointed out that the original meaning of the word could be construed to mean to cross over, migrate, 
perhaps to indicate that Abraham crossed the Euphrates or to indicate that the Hebrews in Egypt were considered foreign laborers. The word Jew and Jewish, by contrast, are post-exilic. Um, they derive from the name Judah, one of the tribes to survive the troublesome 8th century BCE. And in the Hebrew Bible, we find Yehudim used in the books of Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. Um, in the New Testament, Eudaioi is, of course, most infamously used in the Gospel of John for the opponents of Jesus, even though the latter was, of course, also Jewish. In the New Testament, the word Hebrew seems to indicate linguistic or ethnic rather than religious differences. The book of Acts distinguishes between Hellenistic and Hebraic Jews. Hebrews is often used to denote ethnically Jewish Christians as opposed to the Gentile Greek-speaking Christians. So we find it in one of the uh, New Testament letters to the Hebrews, which addresses Christians living in Palestine. Paul, likewise, refers to himself in the letter to Philippians as a Hebrew of Hebrews, born of Hebrews. Thus, the word Hebrew carried multiple meanings, while the word Jew and Jewish, for Christians at least, most often carried the connotation of religious otherness. So, how did these early linguistic distinctions influence the medieval usage of the terms? The question first occurred to me when I was working on the book that Dan mentioned, the English translation of Andrew of St. Victor's Isaiah commentary. Andrew was a canon at the Abbey of St. Vic Victor near Paris, which around the turn of the 12th century was a major center, sorry, in the mid-12th century was a major center of, 12th of spiritual learning. Andrew wrote commentaries on most of the Old Testament canon, the Heptateuch, Samuel and Kings, the Minor and Major Prophets, and Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. And his works are unique for the attention he gave to the Hebrew meaning of scripture and his representation of Jewish exegesis, which he very often also called Hebrew exegesis, the Hebrew meaning of scripture. Um, so the word Hebraeus appears very frequently in his commentaries. How to best translate that word into English? Um, I ran into the problem in the beginning when you say, when you translate it as Hebrew, people think that you're talking about nursing homes. Um, I wanted to have something that sounded more contemporary, so I thought, well, why don't I try translating it as Jewish? Um, so then the problem is, of course, when Andrew also uses the word Judaeus which also is Jewish. So do you translate both words as the same? Um, if you translate both as the same, how would I convey the distinction between the two? It led to the question, so why, when did medieval Christians use which word and what connotations did these words carry? Surprisingly, modern scholars have written very little about this. Samuel Lacks suggested that Andrew's younger contemporary, Peter Comestor, used the word Judei to refer to contemporary Jews and Hebrei to those either of biblical times or those who used their knowledge of Hebrew for biblical interpretation. But what about the overlap between these two meanings? What about contemporary Jews who use their knowledge of Hebrew for biblical interpretation? Um, Andrew sometimes also refers to rabbinical traditions that he encounters and uses as the opinio judeorum as well as the opinio hebraeorum. Did he and his contemporary Christians use the words interchangeably when referring to Jews? As I started to study this, I came to suspect that the choice of words was often deliberate and that the two words conveyed two distinct attitudes that medieval Christians had towards Jews. One of the characteristic features of Andrew's commentaries is his frequent inclusion of materials that he designates as Hebrew. He uses phrases like in Hebraio, in the Hebrew, or in Hebraio habetur, we have in the Hebrew, to refer to the Hebrew text of the Bible, 
but sometimes he also refers to people. Hebrai dikund, the Hebrews are saying, or Hebrai aserund, they, they assert or maintain. In his Leviticus commentary, Andrew describes his teacher Hugh of St. Victor as someone who, I quote, like us, was educated about the literal sense of the Pentateuch by the Hebrews, end quote. Andrew also tells us that he reports interpretations of the text secundum hebraeus, according to the Hebrews. In his Daniel commentary, he says that he presented interpretations that he had, I quote, had received from the most learned of the Hebrews, end quote. Clearly, unlike the New Testament usage cited above, he was not referring to Hebrew-speaking Christians of the first century CE. But he wasn't necessarily referring to contemporary Jews either. As I'll exp explain shortly, Andrew did talk to contemporary Jewish exegetes, just as Theodulf had, but this was not his primary source of knowledge about the Hebrew tradition. Andrew's interest in the Hebrew text and the Hebrew scholars who gave access to it goes even further than Theodulf or Rabanus Morris. It goes back to the fifth century scholar Jerome, who did in fact use a Hebraeus meus. Very often when Andrew says Hebraeus meus, he's not always talking about his own dear Hebrew, but he's actually citing Jerome directly. The text of the Hebrew Bible, Andrew calls the Hebraica Veritas, the Hebrew truth, a term coined by Jerome, and his idea to consult Hebrews about the, this text was also borrowed from the church father, Jerome. So in the quest for understanding medieval Christian attitudes towards Jews, Jerome turns out to be an indispensable figure. While the earliest Christians read the Hebrew scriptures in their Greek translations, or in Latin translations based on these Greek translations, around the year 390 CE, the Bethlehemite monk Jerome started to trans retranslate these scriptures directly from the Hebrew into Latin, arguing that this produced a truer, more reliable, indeed more Christian, version of the Holy Writ. Jerome started his work as a biblical scholar in the 380s with a revision of the Latin Gospels at the behest of Pope Damasus. But further revisions, the book of Psalms and Job, made him frustrated with his state of the old Greek translations and their Latin equivalents, which the Christian church had been using so far. After the death of his patron Damasus, opposition in Rome forced Jerome to relocate to Bethlehem where he dedicated himself to the monastic life and to full-time biblical scholarship, translating the Hebrew, not the Greek, Bible into Latin. Underlying Jerome's translation efforts was the conviction that the Gr Greek Bible was a corrupted version of a text that had been perfectly preserved in the Hebrew. In his view, the latter was closer to God's word as it was really intended, and that's why he called it the Hebraica Veritas, the Hebrew truth. If you doubt the veracity of my translation, he says, ask the Hebrews, he says in the prefaces to his translation to the Pentateuch and Job, and that's exactly what, Jer what Andrew did. Beryl Smalley, in her magisterial study, um, the study of the Bible uh, in the Middle Ages, claimed that Andrew saw himself as a second Jerome. And it is important to appreciate that Andrew's quest for the Hebraica Veritas was done in close imitation of Jerome. In the preface that he wrote to his commentaries on, the all, on all prophetic books, Andrew states that he would scour commentaries and glossed books for commentaries that dealt with a literal sense of these books. And the commentaries meant works by Jerome and glossed books um, are the works th that uh, gloss books almost certainly uh, refers to what later became known as the 12th century Glossa Ordinaria, referred by, by Devora. Uh, Glossa Ordinaria, incidentally, also was chiefly based on Jerome, but also on Carolingian sources, such as Rabanus mentioned earlier. So these two works he intended to supplement with materials he found elsewhere in the Bible. And that's one of the longer quotes in, on your handout. If you're um, 
if you're bored, you can read the Latin, uh, but I'm not. He says, you know, I'm going to take commentaries and gloss books and supplement it with Jewish sources. He uses the word Hebrais here, or by my own labor or by divine inspiration, end quote. So from the prefaces to his commentaries, we can deduce that Andrew envisioned his own commentaries as a kind of supplement to materials that he had excerpted from Jerome. In his prefaces to both Ezekiel and Isaiah, he says he will put Jerome's commentary before ours. And that's not just a polite nod to Jerome's greater authority. He meant it very literally, because the original version of the Ezekiel commentary, for instance, preserved only in one manuscript, featured excerpts from Jerome interspersed with Andrew's own commentary. Later manuscripts were more interested in a Andrew's own voice and left out the Jerome excerpts. Um, the same structure, Jerome excerpts alternated with his own Jewish sourced commentary. We can find in his commentary on the minor prophets uh, to the extent that the, the last part of it only is excerpts from Jerome's commentary. It's likely that he intended to supplement that later with his own commentary or Jewish commentary as well, but that he simply didn't have time to finish it. And in the oldest manuscript of his Isaiah commentary, we find the two works in two separate parts. Um, Jerome in one part, and then Andrew's commentaries his supplement in another part. Later scribes, again, were not all that interested in these excerpts and only were copying and Andrew's work. Now, since Christian scholars in Andrew's time had no active knowledge of the Hebrew language, the text of the Bible itself still remained somewhat out of reach for them. But there were several indirect ways in which this Hebraica Veritas could be accessed. And the first was, of course, by reading Jerome's commentary, who had offered a lot of observations about the Hebrew. And Jerome had already described how he was aided by, by the Hebraeus Meus, a Hebrew who provided him with scrolls and helped him translate difficult passages from the Hebrew. Um, the second method was to imitate Jerome and do one's own personal consultation with contemporary Jews. Thus, like Jerome, Andrew consulted the local Jews, in this case, members of the community living in Paris at the time. All three generations of Christian scholars, Jerome in the fourth century, Theodolf in the ninth, and Andrew in the 12th referred to these contemporary Jewish assistants as Hebrews. So Andrew's approach to the Hebrew text was by actual contacts with living Jews. Andrew used contemporary Jewish suggestions on the meaning of the text. In a way, uh, the Jews were the text, so to say. And Andrew seems to have taken Jerome's approach to the Hebraica, Hebraica Veritas ask the Hebrews quite literally. So Andrew's commentaries in Isaiah offer interesting illustrations of the inclusion of these Hebrew materials in Andrew's work. Um, after offering comments on the text as it was found in the Vulgate, Andrew was not content to just follow Jerome's translation. He adapted, retranslated the text of the Bible, of the Vulgate, to a version that more closely represented the original Hebrew. Um, the interesting thing is that while for later Christ or earlier Christian scholars like Bede, uh, the term Hebraica Veritas almost came to mean Jerome's translation, Andrew uses Hebraica Veritas for the Hebrew text. Jerome's text he calls Nostra Translatio, our translation. So Andrew offers fresh translations of the text into Latin and furnished them with commentaries derived from rabbinical sources. Uh, it's most likely that these came from oral sources. We can also find them in the commentaries of Rashi, Yosef Benkara, Ibn Ezra, or even later Jewish written sources. Now, because his access to Hebrew learning was taking place through the mediation of local rabbis, Andrew's use of it was sometimes a little bit unsophisticated. Um, unwittingly, Andrew stumbled on more than just the Hebrew text. 
he searching for the Hebraica Veritas, Andrew opened up a window into something, something much more, the rich and varied world of Jewish learning in Paris in the 12th century. Um, and some of his translations were not in fact translations, but interpretations. Sometimes when he says, you know, here's the in Hebreo reading, um, he says, no, he, he gives the, 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 the Vulgate rendering of a text. Uh, an example is, for instance, from Isaiah, um, I think it's Isaiah 28, verse 20. Co uh, angastatum est enim stratum, which means as much as the covering is too narrow to wrap oneself in it. And then Andrew says, well, in Hebrew, it means... Uh, there really is, in Hebrew, a master is constrained when getting in. And you read his Hebrew translation, and you say, no, it doesn't. Uh, that's not what it says in Hebrew. In Hebrew, is actually pretty much what it says in the Vulgate. Uh, the solution to the riddle is that the in Hebreo is not, in fact, a translation. He's citing here the commentary of Rashi on the same verse. So he's um, mixing up interpretation and translation. So this about the Hebrew of Andrew. Well, what about the Jews, the Judai? Andrew also uses the word Judai. Uh, very often he uses it to describe contemporary Jewish practices, kosher laws, Sabbath observances, the lunar month. And we know, we, we as may assume that Andrew knew this through his contacts with 12th century Jews. Um, so sometimes it's even with a certain admiration. When it comes in to his description of the Sabbath, uh, Andrew says, even today the Jews avoid not only buying or selling on the Sabbath, but even estimating, bidding, and assessing. Um, so this seems quite positive. But sometimes, however, he uses the word you, Jewish, Judaiorum, to um, for a more disapproving, uh, in a more disapproving way. When it came to eschatology, for instance, it seems that he felt he needed to express disapproval of the Jewish interpretations. Passages that Christians took to be protections, predictions, sorry, predictions about Jesus, but which the Jew took to be about their Messiah, Andrew introduces not with Hebrai dikunt but with Judai dikunt. Uh, and sometimes he's even more explicit. The vain opinion of the Jews say, or the Jews dream that, or they make up the story that, uh, or the Jews promise this themselves with idle hope. So in these cases, he uses the word Judai. It's hard to tell whether some of these beliefs were held by Jews in Andrew's time, uh, some of them may actually describe also Jews that um, come from Jerome's commentaries. Um, but some of the denunciations of messianic beliefs are not derived from Jerome, but can be found in Agadic sources. Uh, the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, Sefer Zerubbabel, uh, the Midrash Hamasiach. So we find Andrew mentioning the idea that the Jews think that there are two messiahs, one from the tribe of Ephraim, the other from the tribe of Judah, and the Jews identify Gog as their antichrist. Um, and twice in the Isaiah commentary, uh, the, the, when he says the, the Jews expect the messianic age, and uh, Andrew quotes Ovid, he says, well, let them wait with the farmer who wait for the river to flow by. These are rare barbs, but um, he uses the word Judei in this context, which seems to indicate that he clearly does not share these beliefs. Um, I think that some of this actually also goes back to Jerome. Um, this idea that there are distinctions between Hebrew and Jew, uh, that idea goes back to Jerome, as Emmanuel Principali has pointed out, Jerome contrasted his positive appreciation of the Hebraica Veritas with a virulent anti-Jewish discourse. Um, 
if, according to Jerome, the true version of the Bible was owed to the Hebrai, it was the Judai who had tried to conceal this scripture from Christians and tried to corrupt it, its text. The original Bible, the Hebrew Bible, was, of course, Jewish scripture. But the Septuagint, which Rome rejected as a true scripture, also had Jewish origins. And, um, you know, we know that perhaps, you know, the, the legend of the origin of the, um, of, of the Septuagint, which stated that the translation was made at the request of King Ptolemy Soter of Egypt, who wished to have the Torah included in his library of Alexandria. Seventy sages from Jerusalem traveled to Alexandria. The Septuagint was the result of their translation. Um, Jerome, uh, some later Christian authors actually um, were, were uh, augmenting this, this uh, legend with more miraculous elements. And Jerome rejects the miraculous elements and says, well, these Jewish translations, translators of the Septuagint, uh, they were not prophets, they were translators. In fact, uh, they sometimes deliberately concealed Christian truths uh, from King Ptolemy uh, and, and were hiding these truths from later Christian authors. So while Jerome regarded the Hebrew Bible as a purer, truer version of the Bible than its Greek versions, uh, there wasn't anything philo-Semitic about, about this stance because he says the Septuagint versions predominantly used by Christians were created by Jews and also corrupted by Jews. So in other words, there are the good Jews, the creators and guardians of the Hebrew Bible, Hebrews, and the corruptors of scriptures and deniers of Christian truth were called Jews. Um, that's the distinction in Jerome's writing the question is, is this also picked up in later time? I would say um, that it is, in fact, uh, picked up by, by Theodulf in his use. Um, and somewhat, I think, it also influenced the, the reading of, um, of Andrew as well. So Jerome's usage doesn't really denote two distinct group of people but rather a distinction in his own attitude towards these people. Hebrei is the word he reserves for the pre-Christian believers of the Old Testament and their trustworthy tradi tr traditions. But the contemporary Jews who educate him on the Hebrew scriptures and who teach him Hebrew are also Hebrei. While the Jews of Jesus' time who rejected the true Messiah and crucified Jesus were the Judai. It's the Hebraica Veritas that Jerome pursued not the Judaica Veritas. Indeed, the latter would have been an oxymoron for Jerome. The ambivalence that Jerome felt towards contemporary Jews as enemies of the Christian faith, on the one hand, and as custodians of the Hebrew scripture and language of the other, he expressed by using these two terms. And by distinguishing between Hebrews and Jews, Jerome could at the same time revile the Septuagint as Jewish scripture, while advocating a return to the Hebrew Bible, which was, of course, also Jewish scripture. But by choosing the double nomenclature, Jerome succeeded in appropriating the Jewish tradition while at the same time vilifying it. So I think that the dichotomy that Principali uncovered in Jerome's writings echoes throughout the Middle Ages and can be applied to most medieval Christian authors. Um, we find his, Jerome's choice reflected in Theodulf, as I said, and maybe with less explicit anti-Jewish virulence in Andrew's writings too. The two words reflected the double attitude that medieval Christians had towards the Jews. Secundum Hebraeus, according to the Hebrews, a positive Jews attitude as Jews as bearers of scripture, but then we have adversus, Judeus against the Jews, a negative attitude against the Jews as the enemies of Christ. One can deplore the one attitude and laud the other, but the fact that is for the fact is that for medieval Christians they went hand in hand. Then I see you look at your watch. Uh, uh, you want me to stop there, right? <laughs>
No, no, no. Okay. Well, five more minutes. Good. Um, Jerome's insistence on the Hebraica Veritas did encourage scholars in centuries to come to explore the rich world of Jewish biblical interpretation. It gave Christians a glimpse of the world of the Judai, the contemporary religious customs and beliefs of the Jews, which they viewed with wonder and awe, and sometimes with a frown. But at least in the brief optimistic period of the 12th century, the fascination and for Andrew, the fascination for the otherness of his Jewish interlocutors prevailed, fed by the notion that amidst all their fabula, a deeper truth, a veritas, was somehow latent. Thank you very much. on? Something? I believe it is. I just need to speak into it. Uh, thank, thank you, Franz. Uh, I cut out some wonderful e examples, uh, so if, if you want to ask me about them. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll have time. Okay. Um, Franz and I have discussed these ideas through uh, much of the semester and a half he's been here, um, and it's been wonderful to be a colleague with him as he's um, thought through uh, this particular set of questions. So the floor is open. Um, I'm monitoring the Zoom chat in case we have any in, Zoom in, questions. Incidentally, um, I, I was fascinated by Judith where it seemed like Hebraeus and Judeus were used interchangeably. I thought, there goes my whole thesis. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this perhaps could be point, counterpoint. Now, I believe I see Devorah with the first question. We're just gonna wait until Camille brings the mic over. Thank you, this is fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if the Hebrew is true, if the Hebrew is veritas, so compared to what? This truth is compared to what falsehood? So you mentioned compared to the, to the Greek Bible. The, so I was wondering if you came across other things that are more false than the Hebrew. For, for Jerome, you mean? Or in any other examples of things, so if, if the Hebrew is true, if it was true compared to something else, if there was something else that was compared to it that was more false yeah. than the Hebrew. No, uh, Rome, uh, Jerome is clearly uh, referring the, the Greek translations and, uh, and the Latin translations based on the Greek. Um, his, his original argument was that there, there are certain quotations found in the New Testament uh, where the New Testament is quoting, you know, scripture. And he says, I can't find that anywhere in, in the Greek. And uh, he says, you know, I find it in the Hebrew instead. Now, the, the, the irony there is that uh, people have been baffled and say he's making it up because um, many of these you can't find in the Hebrew either. Uh, and uh, Jerome really developed the idea that it was Jesus and the apostles used the Hebrew Bible, and that was their Bible. Um, we, we know, and New Testament scholars uh, uh, are, are maintaining that this was not the case. They were using Greek, Greek script, scripture. Um, so only in a few cases, Jerome is actually right about this. My, um, when I'm, I'm right now writing a book called, that I have prof professorially called Hebraica Veritas, and my idea is that the whole idea of Hebraica Veritas is shifting. It's a, it's a concept that everybody uses, but it means something different over the ages. Uh, as I said, for, for Bede, um, Hebraica Veritas is Jerome, uh, which he then contrasts with the Vetus Latina, the older Latin translations based on the uh, based on the on the Septuagint, for Bede, the the big issue was chronology, because the Septuagint had a different chronology from the Hebraica Veritas, and for him, the truth 
you know, it, it was kind of an objective truth of the, 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 the <laughs> how old the world is, uh, which has um, big consequences for when you think it's going to end or when you think it's time for the Messiah to appear. Uh, and he be based that on the, on the Hebrew chronology the chronology of the he Hebraica Veritas, which of course he knew through Jerome, and not on uh, the chronicle of Eusebius, which was based on the Septuagint. Um, but then later, of course, um, with, with the text that Judith was, was dealing with, um, the Vulgate itself, the Hebraica Veritas of Bede, becomes a problematic text because it is, it is corrupted through textual transmission. And to be honest, sometimes Jerome made some errors in his translation as well. And people start to become aware of that. And they read Jerome and they say, well, but in Hebraio habetur. Uh, so for Jerome, uh, sorry, for Andrew, you know, the he in Hebraio habetur, that's the Hebraica veritas that he is accessing to, um, to criticize Jerome, uh, just as the scholars that Judith was uh, talking about are doing. Now, the, as I just said, sometimes the in Hebraio habetur, sometimes he's not really looking at the text, sometimes he's looking at uh, the Targum, or sometimes he's looking at Rashi, um, and I think you know, either, either there's something really sophisticated going on that I don't quite grasp, or he's just wrong about it, and he picked up, he's talking to his Jewish, uh, his Hebraeus Meus, his friend, um, and as Rabbi, uh, as, as Robbie and I have, have figured out, they probably were doing that somewhere in a bar, because, you know, Andrew is really not going to the synagogue, and, and very unlikely that the Jews were uh, admitted at St. Victor either, so maybe they had a few beers and, <laughs> or wine in Paris, uh, Andrew has only a vague memory, and he's mixing up interpretation and translation. Scott, <laughs> Scott. It, uh, I believe we have a question from Ruth Langer, also a part of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. Thank you. Um, I know that you had sought to have uh, Jeremy Cohen be part of this conference, and I'm going to try to invoke him very imperfectly. Um, as well as Talia Fishman from University of Pennsylvania, in that there's a tension that comes in that it's beginning probably already in the 12th century, and is certainly there by the mid-13th century, about this use of rabbinic materials and rabbinic traditions. And Talia's argument is that there's a real crisis in terms of Christian understanding of Jews and the Augustinian understanding of the validity of Jews when it becomes realized that Jews are not living according to the Bible, hmm. but living rather according to Bible interpretation. And that seems like, it, how does that, how does that, is that playing in already in the 12th century in such a way, or is this a refutation or a complication of that whole image of Christian understanding of Jews and intersection with Jews? Are they just going to find out what Jews think of the Bible and everything else is sort of on the side, but it's not if you're using, if you're consulting with Rashi. So. Yeah, that, exactly. Um, and and it's, a, it's a shame that, that uh, Jeremy Cohen couldn't, uh, couldn't come. Uh, I'm, I'm only a poor substitute for, uh, <laughs> for him. Um, his thesis is that, you know, of what is, of course, behind this, this Jewish learning is the Talmud. Once Christians discover this, you know, they're, they're horrified and they see the Talmud as a, as an, as a heretical book. Uh, the reason why, you know, if it weren't for the Talmud, all the Jews would convert to Christianity because they would see the Hebraica Veritas. So there's an, an obstacle to this Hebraica Veritas. Um, interestingly, in the, in the 12th century, I don't see that yet. Um, I see some of it coming in Jerome, in, sorry, in Andrew. Um, and I, I think that has to do with his distinction between the Hebrai and the Yudai. When the Yudai, uh, they're more often people who, who fabulantur. They present these stories. Uh, and clearly, you know, if it's a story, 
it's not veritas. Um, and, or they somnion, they, they're dreaming. Um, and at one point he even says, you know, well, as they have it in their Gamaliel, and that's very interesting because there are a couple of, of sources in the 12th century who mention this Gamaliel um, to refer to the Talmud. Um, so we have an, a very early, um, this is about the same time that Christians for the first time starting to use the word Talmud, uh, Peter the Venerable. Um, so there is, there is an, they come to the realization that they, they, there's really more to it than just um, as, as um, Beryl Smalley called it, a telephone line to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a question in the middle, uh, Camille, and then we'll work our way over. Yes, my question is between the Hebraicus and Judaicus, what about the Israel, is Israelites? Somebody who is a member of a covenant, beloved of God, the Verusi Israel. Do they just make that distinction? Um, as I said in the beginning, my impression is that Christians avoid that term when speaking about Jews, um, partly because they consider themselves the new Israel. Um, so when, when you, I mean, th there's speaking about historical realities of the Old Testament. Of course, um, they talk about the, he the Hebrews and the Jews and the Israelites in the context of the Old Testament. Uh, and then they say, well, the Israelites um, are, you know, the people that are the ten, the 10 tribes or pre-divided monarchy are sometimes used for the entire people. And Christian commentators comment on that uses and, and, and explain that that's what the word means. I have never seen it used for contemporary Jews by Christians. Thank you. Uh, I believe um, further down with with Ravi. So, uh, ready for me? The uh, yeah, you'll always be ready. Uh, so, you and I have talked for years about the question of when somebody like Andrew would talk to Jews about Hebrew Scripture and then assume that what the Jew had said to him was what you and I would call pshat or census literalis, whereas they didn't make a, those Jews might not have had a clear distinction between pshat and drash, between rabbinic readings, or they read it in Rashi, which we know to be nothing but channeled, rechanneled midrash, and it's not what we would call pshat. So my question is, are, are you any closer to getting a control on that understanding of in the literature between um, is there an awareness among either Andrew or the Jews with him with with whom he is in dialogue in in any consistent way does the language shift when they are channeling what they think to be is the true meaning of Hebrew scripture Hebraica veritas or what it's what we on reflection would say yes but that's a midrash and they didn't know the distinction yet. Um, it's it's hard, I think, to make. Um, it 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 is possible that when he says Hebrei dikunt, Hebrei somniant, certainly when they when the the Hebrews dream, which actually he uses too uh, in a few cases, um, or fabulantur, they they tell the story, and fabula is not necessarily negative, right? It's not just about oh, they're making it up. It, it, this, but it's, there's an awareness that this is not text, this is story. Um, Agada, yeah, I think fabula and agada is uh, maybe the same, the same word. He may be even picking up the word fabula from, uh, you know, that, well, they were speaking French together. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what the French word is for um, histoire, um, um, fabliau. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that has a very specific meaning. In the, the in, incidentally, sometimes in and when he really says in Hebraio, you know that's more often the text or the Peshat. And sometimes um, I, I may have made Andrew a little bit more anti-Jewish than he usually is, but sometimes it's really stunning that he cites um, in Hebraio traditions that that just cut. The, the the feet off from under his Christological chair, 
sorry, that's a Dutch metaphor. Um, <laughs> but I think you get my get my gist where where um, at one point in in Isaiah 11 verse 10, where it says about the Messiah in the Latin text in the Latin Bible, et gloriosum sepulcrum eius, and his tomb will be glorious. And Andrew just deadpans. Well, it doesn't say sepulchrum in Hebraeo. It says locum. His place will be glorious. That is the place where he dwells. Incidentally, it's something that he doesn't get from the Hebraeum text, but from the Targum. Um, but of course, you know, the Messiah and his tomb. Yeah, right? It's a, the church of the Holy Sepulchre will be glorious. Amen. Uh, but Andrew says, nah, this is not a reference to the tomb of Jesus. It's just a place where the Messiah will dwell, Zion. It's, yeah, it's st stunning. I think it, it reminded me of Judith's idea. Well, these people are just doing philology right now. Let's just suspend religious differences for the time being. Uh, did I say Diana's hand before? Is that correct? Yes. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really interesting. I wonder um, when we move outside the world of biblical interpretation, and I don't, I'm not sure exactly where this appears in the 12th century. I know where it appears a couple centuries later. You start to get in canon law collections and in pastoral literature little explanations of where the different names for Jews come from, and they tend to all be very positive. So, you know, they're, they're called Jews because of the dignity of the tribe of Judah, or they're called Hebrews because of their ancestor Heber, or it comes from Abraham because Abrahe got turned into Hebrew, right? So none of them are bad. And I don't know if this is in um, the Historia Scholastica. I, I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere, right? So how do we put that fascination with the different names that you can use to talk about Jews into the conversation with this um, uh, the sort of... Uh, special valence given positively or negatively to certain ways of thinking about the people? Um, I, I am not sure, but I, I, I do find the same explanations uh, also in older literature, um, probably from Jerome, uh, <laughs> where Peter Comestor must have picked it up as well. Um, and... Uh, Theodulf, actually quite interesting, when in the hymn that I cited, you know, about the people of the Hebrews, um, he, he starts, uh, he takes the meaning of the word Hebraeus as somebody who is transitioning over, which today has a completely different meaning. Um, but he says, well, the Hebrews are transitioning, right? That's what Hebraeus means. And he says, well, just as um, the, the, the people in Jesus' time were uh, transitioning, you know, they were, they were Hebrews according to the literal sense. We are Hebrews because we go over with Christ um, through his death and passion and will be resurrected with him into eternal life. So there's, there's a lot of uh, layered meaning in, in Hebraeus and in uh, Judeus. Um, quite, quite interesting, I've been thinking also about the, you know, the, the, the least favorite disciple, Judas, right? Why, why is he called Judas? Uh, is that a, an anti-Jewish uh, reference in the New Testament? Uh, I don't know, that's far outside my, my expertise and I leave that to New Testament scholars. Um, I, I do have the feeling that I've um, only stepped on an ant hill and it's starting to crawl in all directions with uh, my explorations of the, these two words. So I'll, if, if you know more references, um, somebody else, uh, uh, told, I, I think it was you, Robbie, who said that in um, the 15th century Spain, Hebrew generally is used for converts, conversos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a question uh, from the chat from Leslie Blackberg. Um, how does the Hebrew-Jewish uh, dichotomy, uh, these word dichotomies, play into the Jewish-Christian debate, which was also part of this period? Which may maybe another way of saying that is, can you extrapolate 
from what Andrew is up to with Hebraios versus Eudaios into what we know is happening with the larger kind of question of Jewish Christian relations yeah. in this time period. Yeah, well, um, and, and you can already go back to the Carolingian period where um, Theodulf is happily employing his Hebraeus Meus, uh, while some other courtiers are, um, like Amolo and Agobard, are clearly uh, very upset about the influence that Jews have at the court of Louis the Pious, um, but they call those not Hebrai, they call them Judai. It's a, they write contra Judaios. Um, and I think that's certainly also, um, I, I have a strange um, theory about it, namely that, that once um, Christians start to be more versed in Hebrew language, um, they, they don't really need the Hebraeus meus anymore. If you have a, a dictionary and a grammar and, uh, and you, you're well versed in Hebrew, um, then the dependence is, is gone. And by that time, uh, the only thing that remains is the Judaeus, who is the religious other, who is seen as an enemy to Christian belief. Uh, so the, the appropriation of scripture that Jerome had started, I think, is, is eventually completed by the end of the Middle Ages, when Christians say, well, I don't really need Jews anymore to look at, I've, I've got the manuscript, I've got a printed edition, I can figure out the Hebrew for myself. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, uh, in the corner, over, yes. Well, thank you very much. I really um, enjoyed your parsing of the various texts. And um, I'm usually, in my own profession, uh, parsing scientific te texts. So this question may be uh, for the wrong group of um, scholars and for the wrong conference, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I wondered, again, about this um, apparent dichotomy between the use of Hebrew and Jewish. Um, how do Muslim scholars treat the translation of um, you know of the of the Jewish Bible, do they have the same you know interpretation um, as you've come up with here? Uh, no, absolutely not, uh, <laughs> because um, what 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 they see as the interpretation of the of the Hebrew Bible is filtered through uh, the the Quran, um, so. What I see in the the, the the Quran's rendering of the same story material in um, uh, of the Hebrew Bible, um, my hunch is that there is a lot of of Talmudic material actually in the Quran that filtered its same its way into the versions of these stories in the Quran. Uh, but I'm I'm at the same time fascinated by this, uh, but not not a specialist on this. Uh, uh, I don't know Arabic for a start. Maybe Jonathan, where I see Robbie's. Uh, Typically, there is there is an eleventh century and beyond reaction in his. Oh, sorry. There is an eleventh century uh, reaction in Muslim literature, which claims that Hebrew scripture is uh, mizuyaf has been counterfeited by Ezra, mm -hmm. so that yeah. he becomes the big villain in that story. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that. Um, uh, that that the if the if the Jews are then no longer people of the book because they have a corrupt book then they can be yeah. they can be persecuted. Yeah. More could be. You said. see that th see that that argument in early Christians too that they say well the Jews have somehow a corrupt version of their of their own scripture, um, but that's only on tiny little verses, uh, right? Even but but in the yeah you're right in the in the um, in in. Islamic thought, uh, it's, it's far from the idea that the text is the Hebraica Veritas. Um, in fact, it, there, it's the, the version as it is in the Quran is the truth. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to end here. Oh, uh, uh, Jonathan, did, did you want to get a word in? I'm going to give, I'm, I'm, yep. I can add to it or leave it. It's, I mean, so, you know, in the Quran itself, you find a distinction between Banu Israel, like this, the children of Israel, who would be the ancient Israelites, <coughs> and the Yehud, who are the Jews, um, you know, related to the 
Hebrew word Yehudi, but the derivation is uh, is imagined differently, right? So, um, whereas Jews and Christians generally related either to the figure of Judah or to the region, right, within ancient Israel of Judea, um, in the Quran you have uh, the reference to Aladina Hadu, right? Those who repent, Hadu Yahud, right? So it's the derivation is imagined to come from the act of repentance. Interesting. Thank you. Do you want to have the final one? Last word? No. no I'll, no. I'll have the last word tomorrow, right? Oh, you're going to get the <laughs> last word tomorrow. Um, so l let me say this. I think uh, what we've heard from Franz and the Q&A represents his very careful reading and his real attention to text and to language and real sensitivity and nuance that is a gift to us. So thank you very much, Franz. Uh, for uh, this insight. Well, maybe I... I <laughs> now he has of course, I have a last word. One of the wonderful things about studying this material together is that it, it creates bonds together and across uh, uh, religions as well. So I hope that uh, we'll have that during our reception. Uh, yes. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> and so um, with that, I uh, let's give Franz a round of applause. <laughs>